Dear Heavenly Father, we commit this service to you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross to save us. And we commit this time to you. We're so grateful that we could gather together in this difficult time when so many churches are not together. And we're so grateful that you've kept us all safe and healthy. You are worthy to be praised in worship. And we worship you this morning in song. And we now worship you by the teaching of your word. May the words I speak be acceptable in your eyes this morning. O Lord, our Redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Years ago, in fact, it was back when books were actually printed on paper, I read a book, and it was called God's Forgetful Pilgrims. And the premise of the book was that Christians, by and large, have forgotten the wondrous identity they have in Christ, and they've settled for the world's substitutes. Unfortunately, I don't think things have changed today. In fact, as I'm sure they've gotten worse as we look at the Christian scene around us. Well, it seems that Christians are not the only ones who forget. Back in Exodus 19, we have a story of the Exodus. Now, in Exodus 19, verse 13, starting in actually verse 1, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, in the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. Verse 3, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. They had been three months on the journey. In that three months, some amazing things had happened to the children of Israel. So, with that in mind, we move over to Exodus 32. And an amazing thing happens. The most classic example of spiritual amnesia is about to occur. We see this as we read verse 1 of uh, Exodus 32. Now, when the people saw uh, that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him, what has become of him. Moses had been gone maybe 40 days. I think the scripture says about 40 days. So during that time, something amazing happened to the people. They said, make gods that shall go before us. They seem to have forgotten a few things that had just happened to them in the last three months. And what's also amazing is Aaron also had forgotten the brother of Moses. They had forgotten that in those last three months, God had produced ten plagues, parted the Red Sea, drowned Pharaoh's army in the sea, provided bread from heaven, produced water out of a rock, defeated a nomadic army called the Malachites, and now, in only this length of time, they had forgotten all that God had done for them. What an amazing thing. You may ask the question, how dense were these people? Why couldn't they remember? Well, seriously, if you think about it, we're no different. We too forget what God has done for us. We, we forget passages like Lamentations 3, 22, when it says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because of His compassion, because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, 
We may not think we are worshiping golden calves, but when we forget to trust God, when we lapse into spiritual amnesia and forget God's faithfulness, when God isn't our first priority, we're allowing other things to become our golden calves. We too are guilty of spiritual amnesia. That is why, as the elders and I talked about what to do this morning in John's absence, we decided that we were going to focus the entire sermon on remembering. That's the title we want to leave with you today. We want to remember one special event. You've also already sung about it. We've, we've prayed about it. We've had scripture readings about it. And now we want to remember a few things about this Passover dinner and the initiation of the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to give you four things to think about. First of all, we need to remember the history of the Passover. Knowing the forgetfulness and the, the people, God instituted a number of feasts for the people. These feasts would remind the people of special events that had taken place in their history. The Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorated Exodus, the Exodus and was one of those times when all the men were required to go to Jerusalem. The Passover Supper was to be the opening event of this week-long feast. In Exodus 13, 3, Moses said to the people, and here it is, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. The Passover dinner is the opening event of the, fest, the feast and is to remind Israel of God's protection when the angel of death passed over their homes, the homes that were covered with the blood of an unblemished lamb. Devout Jews today even celebrate the Passover in remembrance of God's deliverance. So first, we need to remember the history of this Passover. Next, we need to remember the events of the week of the Passover. Now, the... This last week in Jesus' earthly ministry was so important that the gospel writers put down and, and recorded a tremendous amount of their gospels about this last week. Matthew and Mark devote one-third of their gospels to this week. Luke devotes one-fourth of his gospel. And John will devote almost half of his gospel to this last week. So obviously, God wants us to understand what happened that week and how we are affected by that. So here are the events leading up to the Passover supper. We'll start with Saturday. Leaving the ancient city of Jericho, where he had healed blind Barnabas, and staying at the home of Zacchaeus, Jesus arrives in Bethany that evening. He will be staying with his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus during this week, and he will use their home as his headquarters as he goes back and forth into Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had to have been totally exhausted by his journey from Jericho, which was below sea level. He traveled 15 miles and climbed 3,500 feet to reach Bethany. How many of us could do that? So here he is spending the night in Bethany uh, before Sunday. Now on Sunday, we have the triumphal entry. He leaves Bethany, travels the two miles to enter Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. And that's also what we call Palm Sunday because that's when the people put palms in front of him as he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. He went to the temple, looked around, saw the booze and the traitors, and then left without saying a word and went back to Bethany. On Monday, leaving Bethany again, he cleansed the temple for the second time and was questioned by the religious leader as to whose authority he was cleansing the temple. 
Then Tuesday, which is also called the long day, a lot took place. He spent the day in and around the temple debating the religious leaders and ended up on the Mount of Olives giving his seventh and final sermon that is recorded in Matthew's Gospel. Out of Matthew 24 and 25, this is what is called the Olivet Discourse. Now, just for information's sake, the Sermon on the Mount was the first of these seven. Now, he gives the last one on Mount, the Mount of Olives. He ends the evening at the house of Simon the leper where Mary anoints him for burial. And of course the disciples get this all wrong. They see it as a waste of money rather than seeing it as Jesus said, as Mary preparing him for burial. So this is Tuesday night. Wednesday is called the Silent Wednesday because there's nothing in scripture recorded about Jesus' activities. He may have spent it in Bethany or he may have spent it in the hills surrounding um, um, Jerusalem. Uh, I would hate to use the word, he took the day off being God. I don't think he did that. So whatever he did, it's silent in scripture. But on Thursday, we go to Mark chapter 14 and this is where we'll spend our time. We've read the, the Luke passage, now we'll use Mark as our starting point for our time together. Mark 14, 12 to 16. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that we may eat the Passover? And he, sit, and he sent out two of his disciples, Luke said, Peter and John, and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him wherever he goes in. Say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there you will make it ready for us. So the disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Now the question is often asked, well, how could they find this room? Uh, you know, what man was it? Well, uh, according to the culture, it, this man would be easy to spot because normally women or young girls would be carrying the water pitchers. So to see this man carrying a water pitcher, pitcher uh, made it easy to identify him as the man they needed to look for. And just another note, because this was the feast that required all males to attend, the villages around the city as well as Jerusalem itself would have been packed, crowded with people. So in the midst of all that crowded city, one upper room was still available. What are the chances of that? Well, Mark 14, 17 says, in the evening he came with the 12. Jesus and the remaining disciples arrived late on Thursday, uh, Tuesday, excuse me, Thursday, uh, before the meal, which would begin at sundown on that Thursday. Along with the unleavened bread and the roasted lamb and other foods, including some dips for them for the, the bread, there were four cups of diluted wine that were part of the ceremony. The cups of wine came from the four statements God made about his deliverance of the people in Exodus chapter 6. And this is really interesting, at least I thought so. Cup 1. Therefore say to the children of Israel, cup one, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's the cup of thanksgiving. Cup two, the cup of judgment, I will rescue you from their bondage. And cup three, blessing, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Cup four, the cup of praise, I will take you as my people and I will be your God, 
then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Luke 22, 17 says, the meal begins uh, with Jesus taking the first of these cups. He alone mentions the first cup and gives thanks as the host. Verse 17, then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among, your, among yourselves. Then he says in verse 18, For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. It appears that he only drank or partook of that first cup, that cup of blessing, as he passed it around to the men. There's no indication he physically took any of the other cups. Now, the second cup, the cup of judgment, is not mentioned during the supper, but later... Jesus spoke of the cup in the garden before his betrayal. Matthew 26, 38 and 39, he says this, Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrow, sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus drank that second cup of judgment on the cross. Cup three, the cup of blessing. That's the cup that we'll be speaking of later as a part of the Lord's Supper. It symbolized the shedding of his blood for the remission of sins. The fourth cup we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, that is the cup of praise, and um, we'll see that in just a minute. So, the meal has begun with that first cup. During the meal, the disciples continue their long-standing discussion on who would be the greatest in the kingdom. While they were arguing, Jesus got up and without a word began to wash the disciples' feet, even Judas. At the end of that, so when he had washed their feet, taking his garments and sat down again. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he, he who sent him. Now, many people would say, well, if we commemorate the Lord's table, why don't we do foot washings? Well, Jesus was demonstrating to the disciples their need to be a servant leadership, be servant leaders. And this was not to be instituted as a part of any ceremony. In fact, is that's why we see in the epistles only the Lord's table being uh, approved as part of ongoing uh, ministry. Now, some people, some churches do do foot washing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's nowhere in Scripture in the New Testament epistles where foot washing was indicated or required. Jesus resumes his reclining position at the, with the group and continues the meal. And while continuing the meal, he identifies Judas as the betrayer by giving him a piece of unleavened bread dipped in a bowl of sauce. At that point, Judas left the upper room. John comment, commenting on this, saying it was night, John 13, 30. With Judas gone, the final events were set in motion. Rather than looking at the agony of the cross, Jesus looked past the cross and said in John 13, 31 to 3, Now the Son of God is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and I, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, after answering some of the questions about where he was going and why they couldn't come along with him, and while still reclining at the table, Jesus institutes 
the Lord's Supper. So this is the third thing we, we need to remember is the transformation of the Passover ceremony or dinner into what we now call the Lord's Supper. For Jesus, this Passover dinner had two purposes. First, it fulfilled the law that required all males to uh, be a part of this uh, ceremony that the Old Testament commanded in Exodus 21. And second, Jesus would usher in the new covenant as originally spoken of in Jeremiah. Now, the, the disciples were students of the Old Testament, and they would understand its meaning. Jeremiah 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That new covenant is yet to be filled for the nation of Israel. But when Jesus spoke of that new covenant as a part of the Lord's table, he brought us into that covenant. So we have become a part of that covenant that will ultimately be fulfilled with the nation of Israel in the future. But we are entering into that now. So that makes it a very special time that we are now part of that new covenant as Jesus brought us into that. So using the bread and wine, that was part of the Passover, Jesus transformed that Passover dinner into an altogether different ceremony, which is to remind God's new covenant people that there is no longer the law and the sprinkling blood of unblemished lambs, but the grace provided by the atoning death of Jesus. As John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As the Passover dinner was a memorial event, this new ceremony is to be a worshipful, worshipful event. Matthew, as the eyewitness, would record the ceremony. Mark would receive his information from Peter. Luke would piece together the ceremony from all those that were a part of the, there, all of the disciples, and include John, who gave no details of this supper. So these men will piece this together, this ceremony. Now, the Apostle Paul will later affirm and record this in one uh, book, but there is no indication that any of the disciples or Mark or Luke or any of the early church fathers took the bread and wine as anything other than a metaphorical symbol. Jesus wasn't changing the bread into his actual body nor the wine into his actual blood. The ceremony is to be an enactment or a recreation of an event that Jesus would experience 2,000 years ago. It was and is intended to be a communion, a time for all believers to come together and participate in a common communal experience with Jesus. Continuing on in Mark 14:22. Let's look uh, and celebrate this together along with the disciples. Now, uh, each one of you have your little cup. And a word of caution, Jesus did not institute the Lord's Supper until after Judas left. Therefore, only those who are disciples of Christ should partake of this. And we'll speak of this in a little, little later, but... Uh, before we begin, we need to reflect on what this means and as a part of that to look into our own hearts and minds and see if there's any sin that we need to confess as we come to this table. So let's take a few minutes and just silently pray to yourself if there's anything that you need to confess before the Lord. <clears throat> 
Lord, we do thank you for this reminder. Thank you that we could spend this the entire service reflecting back and remembering all that is involved in this supper, realizing that uh, you did this all for us, and this is our opportunity to remember and reflect on that. And thank you for dying to save us from our sins. And in your name we pray. Amen. Verse 22. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Luke will add, do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember as we take the bread together. Lord, we thank you for this reminder of your bodily and brutal sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Amen. Verse 23. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. So, if you are a believer, you are one of the many who Christ shed his blood for you. Let's drink of the cup together. Lord, by your shed blood on the cross, we are freed from the old covenant of the law and can now be partakers of the new covenant of grace. Amen. After they had taken the third cup, the cup of blessing, Jesus spoke of that fourth cup, the cup of praise, in verse 25. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Matthew 26 adds this, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We read about Revelation. This fourth cup is awaiting all of us to drink together with Jesus in the future kingdom at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is exciting to anticipate that fourth cup. So thus far, we have remembered the history of the Passover. We remember the week of the Passover, the transformation of the Passover. Now we need to remember the seriousness of that transformed Passover. That's why we pray before we take the elements, because of the seriousness of, of that, and because of what the Apostle Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, the Passover took place in AD 30. 25 years later, in AD 55, Paul is reminding the Corinthian church of the significance of this ceremony, which is now called the Lord's Supper, because they had forgotten what he had taught them during his two years of ministry with him. Now, you must realize that in A.D. 55, very few, if any, of the Gospels had been written. They, they were still in the process of being written, and they had not been started being distributed, distributed to the people, or copies of that. So when Paul spoke to the Corinthians, he was speaking to them as something that they had not been a part of or not read about. In fact, as he says, that I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So none of the, the Gospels were written. And it was all by tradition, oral tradition. And as you read the Gospels, you, you, you see that it doesn't necessarily... You understand this but you don't necessarily understand the seriousness of it and evidently that is what the the corinthians uh had had developed some sort of an idea that it wasn't something to, a sober sobering event but some sort of an orgy and so that's why he's writing to them and admonishing them 
and warning them of the seriousness of this ceremony. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 9, he says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Paul pointed out that because of the abuse of the Corinthians, that many were sick and others had died uh, from God's judgment. He concludes, For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And that's why when we come to the, the Lord's table, we judge ourselves, we contemplate anything that we have done wrong and confess it before the Lord before we take the Lord's Supper. God wants His Son's Last Supper to be a, uh, significant. He wants us to approach it as sober and a worshipful occasion. Jesus wants you to remember His death in your place. The Apostle Paul answered why we need to remember that. He said, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until He comes again. With this ceremony, we are joyously declaring to the world that Jesus did die, but that he was resurrected and is coming back, not as a suffering servant, but as the conquering king. With this ceremony, we are choosing to never forget the cost of our salvation and always to be reminded to live a holy life in anticipation of the soon return of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Here's actually a, a novel thought that rather than wait each month to have the Lord's Supper and to contemplate our sins, we should be remembering them and judging ourselves on a daily basis, moment by moment, remembering um, of Christ's death in our behalf. And as I thought about the sacrifice that he made, I came... Uh, to mind uh, one of the songs that we often sing, Hallelujah, What a Savior. And it goes like this as we end our time. When he comes, our glorious king, all his ransom home to bring, then anew this song we'll sing, Hallelujah, What a Savior. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we remember together as a church, we celebrate this communion in your honor, thanking you for your sacrifice on our behalf. May we never forget your suffering as we strive to live lives worthy of your sacrifice and live lives that are wholly acceptable in your sight. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.